Tommy, can you can you get Romero to to stop engaging with? Yeah. We're, hello, if people could take their seats. Uh, we're about to start our final panel on social media as the great divider, how technology has led us into our own corners. It will be... Hello? Final panel, social media, how we're driven into our own corners will be moderated by John Petzakas, executive chairman of the board at 11 Discovery. Inc. and a USC graduate from 1989. He's been a driving force behind this conference. And let me s say again how grateful we are for what he's done. John? Thank you, Bob. And, and thank you for the Institute for, uh, for hosting this conference. Um, it's, it's a very timely topic. Um, briefly, uh, to me, I'm not an academic. I am uh, an, a first an attorney. Uh, then became a software executive. So I look for areas that are disruptive. And to me, this concept of tribalism um, is a very disruptive topic. Now, specifically, I think that the governor of Sanford made some good points that, that you know, tribalism itself can be uh, a healthy thing in, in many aspects. I think what, uh, where things really change is where a tribe feels they're under threat and the ramifications of that and the pathology of that. And if you're here this morning, hearing that the first panel, they really went into that topic and, and I think was very powerful. Um, and I think just as mo uh, today, I uh, read uh, a really good article in Vanity Fair. I think really clarified for me, uh, I think what, what, we're dry what, what that means in terms of, of, a, of a certain tribe under threat and, and the power of it. So there's an article in Vanity Fair talking about what's going on at, at Fox News and a bit of a, you know, um, you know, reporting on some differences of opinion uh, uh, on, the, you know, on the impeachment, how to handle it. Um, and the last, uh, there's a quote, quoting the, the Fox News executive. And what he said is that we need to represent our viewers. Um, he says, quote, Fox is about defending our viewers from people who hate them. That's where our power comes from. And there's a lot going on in that quote. And we could have a whole panel on that quote. And, and we could talk about whether that, that threat is real or it's, it's manufactured, whether it's agitated. But, and this is, this is a Fox News executive you know, bragging about his business model. So that power also translates to social media. And so this panel um, is going to examine how uh, social media interplays with tribalism, whether it, it, it accelerates it. And uh, we're going to examine the 2016 election, what's going on now, and then 2020 election, uh, what can change, and, and the dynamics of that. Um, I'm really thrilled we have an excellent all-star panel. And um, so starting with, to my immediate uh, right, is Mickey Kaus. So Mickey is a journalist, a pundit. He's author of the book End of Equality, and he's also written about public policy for multiple outlets, including the Washington Monthly, and uh, Newsweek. He blogs at uh, klausfiles.com and started that in 1999. So he's a blogger ahead of his time. And he was also a, a, a 2010 candidate for U.S. Senate in the Democratic primary. So welcome, Vicky. Uh, that was funny. <laughs> um, next we have uh, Ann Kreigler. Uh, Ann is a professor of political science and, and policy, uh, planning and development. Uh, her research focuses on how, I'm sorry, out of order. Karen North, you guys, you guys were uh, musical chairs. Um, Anna's in the right seat. Uh, so Karen, uh, to, uh, next to Mickey, is the clinical professor of social media at uh, Annenberg School of Communications and Journalism. Um, prior to uh, building the USC's online communications program, uh, Dr. North was the assistant dean of the UCLA School of Public Policy. And she previously worked in the Clinton administration and for Representative Ed Markey. Next to, to Karen is, and, and welcome Karen. Next to Karen is <laughs> Anna Kasparian. Anna is host of the executive producer of the online news show, The Young Turks, and also a new show entitled uh, No Filter. She has won several awards uh, for her work and writes regular op-eds for The Raw Story 
and has been featured in the New York Times and Time.com. And she teaches journalism at, also at Cal State University Northridge. So welcome, ma'am. Okay. Now we have Ann Craigler. Uh, she is professor of political science and policy planning and development. Her research focuses on how people understand and learn about politics from the news media. She's authored three books on American political communication, uh, presidential campaigns, and electoral reforms. And a welcome, Ann. And last but not least is, is Dr. Norbert Schwartz. Uh, Dr. Schwartz is a uh, provost professor of psychology and marketing and co-director of the Mind and Society Center of US, at USC. He investigates the context of sensitivity, of judgment and decision making and its implications for public opinion with a focus on the acceptance of correction and misinformation, misinformation as well as political preferences. He's received distinguished awards from the American Psychological Association and many other groups. Welcome, Doctor. Okay, um, so as I alluded to, we met, heard in the first panel uh, there was a discussion regarding the, the pathology of, of tribalism. And I'll start with you, Doctor uh, Doctor uh, Schwartz. Uh, is there something uniquely particular about the emotional aspect of social media interaction that fosters tribalism? Well, I wouldn't start with the emotional aspect. I think the emotional aspect comes kind of at the end of that. I mean, begin with, no, once upon a time, people had local newspapers, uh, which basically meant that people on the left and on the right often shared at least some exposure to the same facts. As time went by, we got more and more selective. Cable news eventually gave you the chance of picking your own channel, where you're mostly getting your similar things. And social media have really driven that to the extreme, and in two ways. One, your networks are similar, the social homophily in, the, in, in a network. The Facebook and other media filter for you. So if you don't like the stuff, you won't see it again. The more you click it, the more you see it again. Uh, on top of that, your friendly internet provider tracks that too and exposes you to some more things that are filtered to meet your taste. So your friends then also like that and share it and you see it again. So as a result of that, you're getting a more and more selective exposure to the same kind of news. And one of the basic things of how we see the world is what social psychologists call naive realism. The idea is that the world is the way I see it. If you don't see it as I see it, maybe you don't have the right information and I can explain it to you. And if I explain it to you and you don't get it, then probably you're really biased and malevolent and kind of evil. Right? And social media give you that sense that your view of the world is probably right because you are increasingly not exposed to other views. So it's a time where you and your neighbor disagreed on how to evaluate a fact has been replaced with a time where you and your neighbor may disagree on what the fact is in the first place. And social media play to that and allow us to basically feel very confident that we see it right because we don't see the other opinions. And that then sets us up to have a much stronger emotional response to stuff that disconfirms what we think and uh, sets us up to be much more willing to be outraged when everybody agrees with, you, with us and the other guys don't get it right. But I think that's in part, uh, it's a tail end of a increasingly selective information diet. Uh, that's good points. And then, uh, Dr. North, you're a social media expert. Do you have anything else to add to that? Uh, I, let me just amplify. I, I agree 100% with what you said. But my sort of dumbed-down version of that is that it used to be when we were all kids that we would all share our initial news source. We would see the nightly news, read the newspaper, not even the local paper. It could be the bigger picture of news. And then we would gather together with like-minded friends and colleagues and opinion leaders, and we would develop our opinions. But through social media, we generally get our news already in the form of an opinion sent to us because of our pattern of 
liking and engagement on social media. So the problem is you said that people may disagree about the facts. I actually see it that people aren't always exposed to the facts. They only get the opinions. And social media, which I love and is my life, is the double-edged sword that helps us to find like-minded people and helps us to follow the people we care about and our opinion leaders. But at the same time, it separates us into opinion groups before we even have a chance to think through the other side. So I'm letting the academics go first because I want um, then the people who are in the real, the real world on the front lines to, to weigh in. So, uh, I'd like to actually speak so, so to that Anne. question, too, because I, I agree with what both of you have said, but I'd also like to say that social media are also used by the candidates and the campaigns as a tool for communicating with people, and they do convey emotion in their messages out to their followers. And they, in the 2016 campaign, overwhelmingly on Twitter, used contempt. Contempt. Yes. And just one thing, just to jump, I'll just be the person who responds to other people's comments. Um, right, so that's exactly right. But the, you know, what you might consider the sea change of social media is that it allows people to feel that they have a personal connection with people where there is no actual personal connection. And so what happens is, mm -hmm. because we're looking at our phones and the privacy of our own homes or apartments um, or you know, in our cubicles or offices, it feels like a friend called us or texted us or sent us a message or whispered in our ear. And therefore, when people like Donald Trump retweet something that you said, I feel like, oh, he cares about people. It could have been me because it's like he just told me about it, right? And, and so the candidates have become some very savvy mm -hmm. about how to make it feel like a personal connection. And when it's personal, it can be gossipy. And when it's personal, it could be angry. And people don't, aren't as offended by it as if they said it to the nightly news. So, and Anna, you've got millions of followers <laughs> or hundreds of thousands. Wait, I'm sorry? <laughs> oh, on Twitter? Yes. Yeah, so tell, tell us your perspective because you're, you're out there every day on social media. Sure. I think... For me, what's been more frustrating is this assumption that as American voters, we're always rational and we're always thinking about policy and the policies that particular candidates are proposing in a rational way, that we actually care about these policies, we're emotionally and you know individually invested in them. But there's been a great deal of research in tribalism that actually shows that we're not necessarily rational actors because politics is increasingly treated as a sport. It's treated as a sport in the media. There's the winner and the loser, winners and losers. And Donald Trump did something incredibly savvy. Maybe it was unwittingly savvy, but what he kept driving home during his campaign was we're losing. We're losing as Americans. This country's losing. We used to be winners, but we're losing now, which is an incredibly risky message. But then he followed that message with, here are the bad guys. Let's go get them, right? So there's this social identity that we all have. And I think that that social identity plays a big role in how we behave in this political realm. Um, so I, I want to make sure that we keep in mind that rationality is not necessarily, um, you know, something that drives us. But one other thing that I will note is, you know, you made such a great point about how there's a lot more media now. There's a lot more to choose from. You know, you don't have four major networks and that's it. And so as a result, you have all these different ind independent media outlets online that are trying to compete with one another and they try to out edge one another. Right? They want to appeal to a very specific group of people and make sure that they're loyal to that specific group of people and they don't deviate from that message. And I think that that's also leading into this tribalist mentality when it comes to politics. Yeah. So, so Mickey, um, I noticed this morning you've got almost 40,000 Twitter followers. I have 322, um, but who's counting? Um, and, and I assume, though, that Correct me if I'm wrong, but you, you didn't get those followers through a lot of just nuanced and, uh, you know, uh, rational thought necessarily versus uh, kind of uh, agitation potent but potentially. So I see, I see, I've been reading your Twitter feed. It's really good stuff. But tell me your thoughts there about how you use social media because you've been doing that for a while. Well, um, uh, I, I'm, one of the, I'm one of those semi 
conservatives who think Twitter is conspiring against them. So it really should be 4 million followers. Yeah. It's only 40. I feel the same way, absolutely. Uh, uh, I, 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 I have no strategy. That's why I'm doing as badly as I am. I just say what I think. And uh, occasionally people with large followings link to me, and that's, that's the key. And then you try to suck up to those people, and then you're on the road to corruption. Uh, <laughs> but uh, that's basically what happened. What I, wanted to, what I wanted to focus on was a non – all these things are true, but there is a non-web dynamic here, which is uh, – you know, after the 2016 election, we could have treated it like a, like a sports game where we said, okay, uh, we lost, next time we'll win. The Democrats could have treated it as a, as a, they lost this week, they'll come back next week, they'll come back next time. Or uh, they could have reacted the way Democrats did after the Reagan victory in 1980, which is they were filled with self-criticism and almost self-contempt. And they said, what have we done wrong? Are the Republicans right about this? They, they formed the Democratic leadership conference, there were symposia where even Barney Frank criticized that, you know, the Democrats have been the not supposed to party and we did this wrong and that wrong. None of that happened. Demo Democrats instead were incredibly righteous. They did not accept the loss. They're even now trying to unhappen and undo the loss with impeachment. Uh, and I think that's what drives a lot of the cocooning. Uh, and I blame arc of historyism. The, the, the idea that Democrats weren't just a party, they were on the right side of history. The arc of history was bending in their direction. So when Trump won, it was such a shock because it was, uh, they were losing their birthright and their moral birthright that they refused to accept it in, in the same way that Jimmy Carter supporters did accept Reagan's victory. Uh, and I, I'm stunned by the level of uh, cocooning and blocking that occurs on Twitter from the left. Uh, you have people who are hair trigger blockers who just, anytime you criticize them, they block you. You have the phenomenon of mass blocking where people make these lists of uh, conservatives that they just don't want, to, don't want to hear from and they block 50,000 of them at one time. Okay, I'm on okay. 55 of so, those So lists. you were serious about that comment about the, the conservative... Uh, I conservative. think there's a sensitivity. Well, I, right. I should ask... I, I, want I was to, just joking. But, I, uh, so, so let's then... Uh, Karen, what, what are your thoughts there? Is there, is there a conspiracy against, against okay, conservatives? I Luckily, I have no microphone. Um, so, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> so, um, is there a conspiracy? I, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, so my answer to that is almost always no. But if, so it goes back to what maybe Norbert said, that um, the way that it works is mathematical, right? So the, we, we always think of it, it goes back to what you just said, People are not making rational decisions. People are acting, I think, usually based on thought leaders. Okay, I'll just go with my thought leader. But the problem is that the thought leaders now are not just the people you trust. They're also the algorithm or the mathematical formula that's imposed by the platform that you follow, whether it's Twitter or Facebook or Instagram. And that has to do with mechanically cataloging what you do and therefore feeding you information or, um, or blocking you or whatever. So there's no conspiracy per se, but as people get in groups and as people follow their leaders, they teach the algorithm to have biases for and against each of us in different ways for different topics. But it's not necessarily symmetrical. If you look at the top 10 block sites on Twitter, they are all either right-wingers or pedophiles. Uh, and and there's, there's only one pedophile on the list, actually. So uh, I just thought we shouldn't assume that both sides do it the same way. Some, you know, and I want to ask... Well, wait, can I, can I just respond to that? Since we're sharing a mic. The, so the thing is that it's not that the, the powers that be at Twitter are making a decision that pedophiles and right-wingers should be blocked... It has to do with the way that people are engaging with those groups. It has to do with people reporting abuses. Now, whether or not, let's, I'll take it as your premise, okay? Because I don't know the actual numbers, and I know that I was just up there meeting with some of the platforms, and they sort of deny the bias. So I'm willing to accept that. But if part of the algorithm has to do with whether or not people report abuse, and if the left wing is in the habit of reporting abuse 
rather than tolerating it. And if the right wing doesn't report the abuse, then the reporters of abuse will end up winning that game because the people they report will get blocked. Exactly. Okay? Yeah. But there's, but there's so, no, that's not a bias. Let, of course big, it's a bias. If the left blocks, the left reports more than the right, so the left wins. That's a bias. Yeah. But then, that's I not think, a bias. I, I think part of the problem is these organizations and these platforms are so incredibly opaque when it comes to what they're doing, what drives the algorithm, and why it is that certain people do get deplatformed, whereas other people uh, can essentially behave the same way and they remain on those platforms. And so the problem is, you know, I think that there's overwhelming pressure to deplatform some people and then they'll decide to deplatform that person and they'll cite their guidelines and then they'll muddy the message by saying we don't accept hate speech, but 95% of Twitter is hate speech. <laughs> I mean, come on. So it's it's just opaque and ham-handed. They don't know what they're doing when it comes to their actual guidelines and enforcing them equally. That's a huge problem. I don't think that there's a conspiracy, but I do actually want to go back to a point that you made earlier that was made in the previous panel that drives me crazy because it's a perfect example of cocooning and just buying into a message that isn't true at all. So this whole notion that you know the left wing has not accepted that Donald Trump has been elected president, the left wing accepts that he's been elected president. This impeachment inquiry is not about not accepting his election. He broke a law. He asked a foreign leader to meddle in our election by digging up dirt on his political opponent. So let's just be clear about that. If someone breaks a law and they're the president of the United States, they don't get to get treated as if they're above the law. So I just, I just really want to make that point because this whole notion that we're bitter and we're going after Trump for no reason at all is ridiculous. So speaking of Trump... Um, 2016 election, I, I remember distinctively that uh, I was reading stories that was making me feel good as a Democrat that, man, Trump is in disarray. He's got no campaign structure. Uh, there's no ground game. There's no um, uh, you know, field offices in swing states. And uh, then, though, after he wins the election, then we learn that he outspent uh, Hillary in Facebook ads uh, two to one and had a, just a far big, better social media um, present. So has this completely, this is a question for the panel, has this completely transformed uh, how elections are going to be run? And was that uh, persistent genius or somewhat accidental by the Trump campaign? Well, I think that he was picking up the mantle from the Obama team, which had also been very effective on social media, but he was able to get more people on the Republican side, which had not been the case in the 2008 and 2012 elections. He was um, putting his son-in-law, Jared Kushner, in charge of the social media campaign, and he did it in a way that was brilliant because it was very decentralized, and he had it had people blogging and putting up memes and doing all kinds of things around the country, um, which went viral. So that was very smart. It also was smart because he was doing it in a way that um, supplemented the larger messages that he was making himself. And he was he's comes out of the entertainment and the business world. He knows how to play the media, and he played it beautifully on social media, the social media are not just targeted the public. They're also targeted journalists, especially Twitter. So Twitter was clearly used by the Trump campaign very effectively to, get, to uh, um, escalate their coverage in the news media. And he used that as a very easy and eloquent tool for getting his message out broadly, not only in social media, but also in the more traditional media. And let me just add to that. It's not just Jared Kushner, but if you go back be before the campaign, before he even ran for office, his son has been sort of a brilliant social media influencer for a long time. Right. Very engaging, extremely fun mm -hmm. to watch. So there was that. But also, if you want to look at social media, I mean, most people don't look at it this way, but if you look at it as... A, an extension of who you are and sort of your own, you know, everybody says this, but like your own PR branch. The question is, do you come across as genuine and authentic and likable and, you know, approachable? And so he didn't just, the Trump campaign wasn't just a social media Facebook campaign or, tw or Twitter, because I think it was actually more Twitter than 
Facebook. But the, the reality is that he was also going to football stadiums in the middle of the night and going to, as, um, as was said in the last panel, going to Erie, Pennsylvania. Like places, Hillary Clinton was talking to influencers, meaning political opinion leaders. And Donald Trump was going to the people, and then he was using social media to speak to the people. And if, if you liked him or if you were neutral... It came across as a very, like, embracing, open-armed approach to the election, which people today, I mean, I'm a Democrat, obviously I worked in the Clinton White House, but, you know, people today don't want to look at it that way, but you look at that campaign, and if you flip-flopped that and said, there, there was a play that was done in Washington, D.C., where they flipped the, um, the campaign rhetoric of Donald Trump and um, Hillary Clinton, and at the end of the play, you realize that you were cheering for the wrong person, okay? So, but if you think about Donald Trump's campaign, it sounded like FDR or Harry Truman. And so you have to think about how they did this incredible, incredibly consistent approach, regardless of, you know, the Democrats' belief that it was not accurate or, or truthful. Yeah. And then in terms of media now, so uh, there... Uh, I think there's been a sea change. And, and, and Anna, I mean, your news uh, organization, you are almost exclusively on in YouTube and, and Internet, social media. I mean, do you see what's the future now for, for news media and, and leveraging social media? Oh, I'd love to know the answer to that. Because the media landscape is constantly changing, constantly evolving. At some points, feels like it's devolving. <laughs> but... Uh, you just have no idea where it's going to go. I mean, what I like to look at is demographics and where the viewers are. So, for instance, a lot of our viewership relies on the millennial generation. Um, you know, people who look like me, they're around my age and care about the same types of issues I care about. I have seen this uh, reemergence of some of the more establishment news outlets like the New York Times, the Washington Post. You know, there is a silver lining. As a progressive, I'll say there is a silver lining to the Trump administration. And that silver lining is all of a sudden we're seeing investigative journalism again. We're seeing more resources be put into real you know, expose type journalism, which is incredibly important. And I hope it continues on regardless of who the president is, whether it's a Democrat or a Republican. Um, but when it comes to digital media, we're in a lot of trouble right now because of some of these bad faith actors who have decided to exploit it for their own unsavory purposes. So if you have, you know, YouTube flooded with white supremacist content, well, then advertisers flee, they're gone. They don't want their, their content on any type of political or their advertisement on any type of political content. And so digital media is really struggling right now. Yeah. I think there's a dark lining to the silver lining, though, because of the way the New York Times saved itself is by paid subscriptions. And uh, as a result, they're not loyal to their advertisers who sort of wanted political neutrality. They're loyal to their readers who are, by and large, anti-Trump activists. So we had this weird episode where... The readers pressured the Times into changing a headline, which was a terrible headline, but that wouldn't have happened before. I also think the, the advent of paywalls limits the extent to which people even read neutral facts. For example, I wanted to go in the Washington Post yesterday to read Philip Bump talk about how Trump's impeachment defenses don't hold up, and I went there, and all of a sudden they wanted to charge me money. Well, I'm happy to listen to the other side. Damned if I'm going to pay to listen to the other side. So I think the neutral ground sort of evaporates. Actually, I, I disagree that advertisers are neutral. I think that the advertising model actually does lead to quite a bit of biased coverage. So, for instance, if you are a media outlet that relies on a giant pharmaceutical company to help fund your coverage, are you going to do a hard-hitting story on the opioid epidemic and call out the pharmaceutical company that makes that opioid? It's Good unlikely. Point. Good point. I agree with that. And by the way, let me just because I'm going to comment on everybody, right? Um, <laughs> this is my thing. Um, not only is news back in the business of breaking news, but young people and people of all ages and demographics are now interested in the news again. It's exciting and it's entertaining and it's sort of suspenseful. 
And so, and there are different voices. So you could find the voice that you trust or that you res that resonates with you. So there is a bigger audience and a more invested, engaged audience than we've seen in decades. Yeah. And then, Norbert, back to that really ties into your original comments at the beginning of the panel. I mean, it seems like social media is like instant con confirmation bias, and it's very readily uh, able. And so, it, and and the challenge from a business perspective. Uh, what's the business model? It's getting clicks. It's 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 getting more and more followers, and um, it seems like that's a, a, a recipe for supercharged tribalism and, and confirmation bias. Yeah, I mean it's definitely increasing confirmation bias. I mean there's no doubt about it, and uh, it's increasing the frequency of exposure to similar things. And one can't underestimate the power of that. So, I mean, demagogues have assumed for millennia uh, that if you just repeat it often enough, you can turn a lie into truth. And empirically, that is the case. I mean, psychologists since the 1970s have done experiments where the only thing that varies is how often you have seen a statement. So there's, you, know, you watch different things, you have to name the color quickly or some other rules for why you get exposed to these uh, statements. And then a while later, you get a bunch of statements and you have to say if you think whether it's true or not. And the more often you have seen this thing, even if you have no explicit memory of it, the more likely you are to accept it as true. Uh, and uh, there is no easy way to protect against that. Uh, no, you can reduce it somewhat, but only under one condition. If you say, before you see any of these statements, some of the stuff that you will see is false, Please pay attention to what may be false. That works. That reduces it somewhat. Anything else, when you're not thinking about it when you see it, if it's just kind of floating by as you're doing something else, increases the likelihood that you will find that statement true when you see it again. Not because you have accepted it now, but because it feels more familiar. It feels like you've heard it before. And so more often it feels... The more Often you see it, and the more familiar it feels, the more likely you are to assume that there's something to it. And you can even get this effect when you say it is not the case. I have one experiment where we give people health statements, like shark cartilage is good for your arthritis. And in some condition we say the FDA has determined that this is true, and in others we say it has determined that this is false. When you ask people immediately, say, no, wait, you just told them it's true or it's false. But when you wait two days and you then show them the statement again and you ask them whether it's true or false, the only thing that predicts whether they accept it is how often they have seen it. So we can increase acceptance of that statement by telling people three times that it is false. And you're more vulnerable to that uh, the, more, the less you have concentrated or the poorer your memory is, which makes older citizens more vulnerable to these effects than younger. But that's trying to correct people's idea by saying explicitly it's false. And the more often you do this, the more they believe it. So that's, now, now think about what social media do with the you know, liking and reposting and repeating and so on. And what the regular media do by repeating every line Trump says, the more absurd the line is, the more repetitions it gets. That's not a neutral thing. You know, the crazy thing about that is that the, the people in this audience here today are not really likely to be subject to that because the more engaged you are in the topic, the more you know, the less you're subject to these sort of influence cues. But you think about the rest of the country who don't have the time and inclination to pay attention to every detail and to dig in and read and care, then they're just being influenced every day by the repetition. So you start thinking about how, um, how that becomes a huge wave of influence rather than, a, you know, an individual moment. So um, let's talk about timely topic and social media. So the, up, the impeachment is now upon us. What role do we see like a new era now with not only impeachment but the era of social media? What role is social media going to play? Is it going to have it be even more pol uh, polarized than, than, than normal? What does the panel think about that? 
Well, one thing that I've noticed with social media is how it doesn't ever fail to bring up the receipts of past impeachments, but particularly the impeachment uh, hearings for Bill Clinton. So, for instance, uh, a video emerged featuring uh, Senator Lindsey Graham, who is a big supporter of Donald Trump and very much against uh, the impeachment inquiry uh, against him. And so this video from the 1990s, I believe it's from 1999, features a young Lindsey Graham uh, on the Senate floor wagging his finger and saying that, you know, Bill Clinton doesn't even have to have committed a crime, okay? Just the fact that he uh, has ruined uh, the legitimacy of the office with his behavior is enough. That is enough to impeach him. And then you fast forward to today, and you see these videos of Lindsey Graham going viral where he just straight up says, well, you know, there's no evidence that uh, President Trump has committed a crime. Therefore, it is impossible to impeach him. Let's move on. Now, what's funny is these two impeachment cases are very different from one another. In one case, you do have evidence of Trump committing a crime and asking a foreign leader to dig up dirt on his political opponent. There is a transcript of that. It is available to the public. On the other hand, you have someone who had uh, a, a consensual, although unethical, affair, and that's not a crime, right? So anyway, I'm bringing this all up because social media does have this incredible ability of revealing the receipts, right? It, it brings back what politicians have said in the past. And it's really interesting to see some of the more establishment politicians who have been around for a while kind of catching up to this new culture where people will dig up what they've said in the past. They will look for the tapes, they will look for the videos, and they will call out the hypocrisy. So that's an interesting part of uh, social media in regard to this impeachment inquiry. Yeah, Anne, what, what, what your perspective? Yeah, that's the social aspect in social media. And a lot of politicians, I think, forget about the social aspect of it and focus only on the old school, top-down kind of communication um, avenue. And that's really missing the boat. Also, can I just say that social media has been um, instrumental in convincing political campaigns and other people that short-term goals are the best solution. And you know what's like heartbreaking to me is that people on both sides of the aisle will pursue something because they see the opportunity for a short-term goal without thinking of the long-term ramifications. Um, and my big example is always cloture. You know, we were the ones who said, let's change cloture to a simple majority back in the Obama administration. And I thought, oh, my God, what happens? And I thought that it would end up affecting legislation. Like, we'll just go to, we'll kill the filibuster for legislative things, not for the Supreme Court. But, you know, you have to think, I mean, I go back, I became a real patriot when I worked in D.C. And I go back to, I don't know how they did it, but the founding fathers put together a process of government, a system of government that is unlike any other in the world or any other in history that has so many checks and balances and so many ways of protecting us from any individual or for infighting or for the problem of the day. And every time we chip away at something that I consider to be part of the process, it pains me because I think it's the process, not the people that matter in our, democr in our democracy. I'm, I'm a little worried that Trump is going to – well, you, you would hope that the reaction to people realizing that, hey, we said the exact opposite thing under Clinton would be that they would then think, wait, what's the right rule? And, and, and settle on like a, a neutral rule that they could say in both situations. And I think the neutral rule is it, it, it doesn't have to be a crime, but it has to be a, quote, high crime, which it has to be something really bad. And what Clinton did, did wasn't really bad, so he shouldn't have been impeached. And you can make the argument that what – I would make the argument that what Trump did isn't really bad. He shouldn't be impeached. I worry that Trump will go too partisan, and instead of making the sensible defense, he will just try to rev up his own troops uh, and say, oh, this is fake news. The whistleblower is a, you know, is a lying partisan. And, and I'm not sure he wins that that fight. I think he'd be much better if he went for the neutral ground. I, I, I noticed that there was a um, documentary on the biosphere, too, uh, th that disaster where they tried to create a separate, whole separate world, separate ecology in 
is it New Mexico or Arizona? And I noticed that Steve Bannon was involved in creating Biosphere 2. And I'm worried that the right will create Mediasphere 2, which is they're now about to abandon Fox because Fox is going to the left. And they'll embrace OAN, One America News, and a couple of little weird things. And they'll create this little hermetically sealed right-wing Mediasphere that, like Biosphere 2, will be a disaster because it's not big enough. Okay. Um, we'll see if that, that, that comes, comes true. But um, let's see. So then moving on. Uh, so, yeah, well, impeachment, I think it's going to be interesting because it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a new era. And, and I, I, I've already seen the needle move very fast. And you wonder that's because social media and, and kind of it, it, the way that it's can supercharge uh, public opinion. So what about the 2020 election? Looking ahead, what are our predictions here? There, there's some indications already that it's going to be a huge battleground on social media. Um, there's this organization called the Epoch Times that was buying millions of dollars of Facebook ads, pro-Trump ads. We see um, other examples of that. Uh, so a lot of people worry that it's going to be even worse for 2020. But, but what, what does the panel think? Well, I can just say, you know, we're obviously over a year till the election actually takes place. And it's already gotten pretty bad. It really has. Uh, the rhetoric online, the types of fake news stories that I've already seen from ridiculous websites that I just, I really wish that as a country, we emphasized media literacy. Just take a look at that URL before you believe the story, right? Like, I mean, it's just incredible. But I, I have already, you know, internally prepared myself for an election season that's going to be even worse than it was the last time around. I really think it's going to be worse. I mean, my, I, for the life of me, don't understand why this hasn't happened, but I wonder almost every day why we haven't, as a government, um, taken the, uh, the, um, the advertising regulations for traditional media and extended it to digital media. I, for the life of me, don't understand it. Some lawyer has to explain it to me. But I always wonder, you know, it goes back to if you see it, you might believe it. Well, why is it that on television, radio, newspapers, magazines, you see something and it says this ad paid for by and I, the candidate, endorse this message, right? What if you take like Cambridge, I mean, when we talk about fake news, it's probably not the Trump administration doing it, but it could be Cambridge Analytica, right? And then why doesn't it say this message brought to you by the Kremlin. And if it said that, wouldn't we think twice before believing it? And if it said, if you forced Donald Trump to say, or Elizabeth Warren or anybody to say, I, the candidate, endorse this, they would think twice before endorsing a message from a sinister foreign or domestic entity. I don't know why we haven't done that. So I'd love to see more studies into that because, you know, what I'm about to provide is anecdotal evidence, but it was shocking to me the last time, um, the last election season, so a family friend of mine had posted, so she was convinced that Bernie Sanders is a communist, okay? She, yeah, as a socialist, but was, a, was you know, a Soviet-style, you know, Fidel Castro-style communist, which is ridiculous. But nonetheless, uh, she had posted a fake news article about how the Castros had met with Bernie Sanders and they were applauding him and they were trying to push out propaganda in favor of him, all this nonsense. So I was like, oh wow, this is a pretty incredible article. Let me click on it and read it and see what this is about. And so it was a satirical website. It was like The Onion. And I only mention that because when I informed her of what the reality was, that this is satire, this isn't real news, she didn't keep, she kept it up. She didn't take it down. She refused to believe anything I had to say. Her social identity was so ingrained in hating Bernie Sanders and thinking that he's a Soviet style communist that she didn't care about anything that would go against her preconceived notion. But it goes back to, and you could go into more depth, but it goes back to what Norbert said at the beginning. If you start, if the ad is first given to you with the message saying, this, was, this is satire. If they ran that as a story on Saturday Night Live, she would not then dig in and believe it. If you say, you better not even fact check this, but this, was, this message was provided by the Kremlin, then she wouldn't believe it. She might be entertained by it, 
But the problem is that once somebody reads it and integrates it into their belief system, and then you go back and say, oh, by the way, you were duped and fooled, it's like you know the thing about the democratic approach. This is, I'm sorry, but it is our approach right now. You say to people, you're stupid and you're a racist, so we want you to change your party affiliation to Democrat. And people go, wait a minute, I'm not stupid and I'm not a racist. And then they start trying to rationalize their beliefs based on the fact that you just pushed too hard and you insulted them too much. So it's the same thing. Once somebody embraces it, it's hard to get them to flip around. But it's a lot easier. You could explain it to us. It's a lot easier if you start out with the disclaimer. Am I... And that's the good point. And maybe maybe you comment on this. <laughs> Dr. Schwartz, do you have a comment? Well, no, I, I mean, I, I fully I fully agree, uh, I mean, with what you say. I mean, it's much harder. I mean, once you have taken a position, it's much harder to move people away from that. I'm a little more skeptical uh, on the fact-checking. I mean, you know, the media literacy efforts, which are always good ideas. But for all we can tell, people are not engaging in checking the URL unless they disagree. So if the message is on your side and fits what you think the world looks like, then you're very unlikely to double check because you have just validated it, right? I mean, you're a smart person and you agree with it. Uh, it's only when it's on the other side that you use your media literacy skills. I also wanted to point to this incredible researcher. Her name is uh, Liliana Mason. Uh, she wrote a book uh, titled Uncivil Agreement. And in it, she talks about this one study regarding giving someone uh, uh, evidence of a political issue that they, let's say they agree with the issue, then they're given evidence that would, I mean, ideally make them disagree with it, right? This policy is actually bad for you. So if you give someone who's very engaged in politics, very informed in politics, they live and breathe politics, information that's contrary to their preconceived notions, they actually spend a longer period of time reading it, not because they're absorbing it, but because they're trying to rebut it line by line. And so this is, kind of goes back to what I started this panel talking about. We are not necessarily rational beings. We're driven by our social identity. You know, we hear a lot about like, oh, identity politics, it's terrible. We need to move away from identity politics. But the very people who complain about identity politics have a social identity that's so ingrained that they will reject evidence that's contrary to what they already believe. So I, I by the way, I agree with that, but the, except for one thing, and that is that it, it reminds me of when I was up meeting with some of the big tech social media companies last week or the week before. And one of the questions that was asked was, how do we flip the religious right? And it's like, what do you mean flip that? Like, how do you get them to vote Dem? And I thought, it's a crusade for them, right? It is not, that is not the group to flip. So if you give them the stuff that counters their argument, they will go line by line and try to find the argument. But the election, every election, every persuasive effort is not about the people on the margins. It's about all of the rest of us, the 90% of us that are in the middle. Try, we're leaning to the left or we're leaning to the right, and it's trying to get people to lean. It's not trying to get the evangelists to change their opinion. So that's why, I, I mean, I think that you're right, but I think we always need to think about how most of us, people who have these like very strong political identities, social identities, we're not the swing voters and we're not the people to persuade. It's the people who are less passionate. I think all these problems are true, but Trump did not win because of social media. He did not win because of tribalism. He won because enough people in the country didn't like the direction the country was going, that they didn't want a continuation with Hillary. They were willing to gamble on Trump. If, he, if the Democrats wage the campaign on those grounds, they have a good shot at winning because Trump hasn't delivered on a lot of what he promised. Uh, I'm worried that because of social media and tribalism, they are off on this impeachment jag, which may well cost them the election. But you make it sound as if Trump had won a popular vote, which he hasn't. He won right? enough to win the Electoral College as president. Uh, yes. And, and I mean, uh, to some extent, social media helped with that, right? Because you can target it much more clearly. 
I mean, if you're wanting to move small groups, then social media allow you a much closer targeting than you would get with network advertisements or newspaper advertisements. So uh, it, it's, uh, I, th I think the social media piece is not irrelevant here in terms of the targeting point that would allow you to go after relatively specific groups that you can identify. So with, without, you may be right. I mean, without social, you're, you're just claiming without social media, Trump would have lost the Electoral College despite whatever appeal he has and despite the fact that Hillary didn't go to Wisconsin. Uh, and you may be right. I, I, do, not, I do not know. I mean, I, I do not know. I, I just think that it's important to keep in mind that there was some three million votes difference. Trump did not win in any broad sense the election. He won enough specific groups in a select group of states to win the electoral college. And that kind of targeting is easier on social media than it would have been in earlier times. Do you know, I think that the bigger impact of social media, so I, I'm a huge believer in the electoral college um, and not the popular vote. And I'm a Democrat, okay? I just think that you, what happens to Alaska or Montana or New Hampshire or Mississippi or West Virginia, if you get rid of the Electoral College, you get rid of the six cities, like control everything. They happen to be the six cities I agree with, but I just don't think it's right. And I think that the Founding Fathers had it right for, I believe, the reverse reason back then. But the bigger impact, I think, of social media so I worked for the Clintons. The Clintons did everything based on polling data. For example, they had a cat, but polling data said they should have a dog. So they got a dog. And polling data said that they should name the dog Buddy, so they named the dog Buddy, okay? It was crazy things like that. Do you remember Bill and Hillary Clinton going to a dude ranch and riding horses? Do you think Hillary Clinton wanted to go to a dude ranch and ride a horse? I don't know the answer to that, but I do know that the popular president before that Ron, Ronald and Nancy Reagan had a ranch and went horseback riding because that was their thing. And America wanted to see their president on a horse again, right? Polling data sent them to a dude ranch. So the question is, what decisions did Hillary Clinton make based on polling data? Because my personal belief without any actual knowledge is that she made every decision based on polling data. Then you ask yourself, why, what did people say to the pollsters when the pollsters called them? And they said... Do, will you vote for Donald Trump? And they lived somewhere where Donald Trump was being portrayed as the devil. Did they say, oh, God, no, I want Hillary Clinton? Or what do you think about a female president? Yes, yes, I want that. Because that is what they see on social media, and they feel shamed to express their actual opinions. I believe that social media has interfered with polling data to the point that campaigns, candidates, and people who are pr proposing legislation have fake knowledge about what people believe in and what people want. That's my opinion. Okay, so um, there seems to be consensus that social media is a big mover uh, of public opinion. It can feed into tribalism, confirmation bias. So before we go, we have five minutes before Q&A. So um, let's talk about solutions because I'm in business and, and we're not going to – you guys can't just be up here and talk about it. you got to solve it. I'm not going to let you go until we solve this issue. So <laughs> – uh, what what can we do to diffuse tribalism, especially as it's supercharged on social media? I'll start. All right. Get off social media for a minute and go outside and socialize with real people. I think I think that that helps. And the reason why I say that is because when you're communicating with people through a computer it's really hard to humanize them sometimes, right? So I think one of the biggest issues we have is because of this tribalistic environment that's um, being exacerbated by social media, we don't see the other side as people. We don't see them as fellow Americans. We don't see them as our peers. And I think going out there and being in a social setting with them helps you humanize them. I mean, I remember after the election, I was on a plane seated next to a woman who was a Trump supporter. And I thought to myself, you know what? This is a great opportunity to have a conversation with a person in real life who's very different from me, politically speaking. And it was a wonderful, I mean, that five hour flight went by so quickly and I understood what drove her. She understood what drove me. We wanted the same things, 
but we were also incredibly frustrated at our politicians and where we were as a country and how we weren't getting certain things that we felt we needed as Americans. So that was an important conversation to have. Get out there, talk to people, put yourself in a situation where you're forced to talk to people who disagree with you. I think that helps. I think that's an excellent strategy for all of us to try. Uh, A lot of the research is focusing also on what leadership can do. And one of the really interesting studies I saw from Leone Huddy and her colleague from Israel, uh, Professor Yair, was to look at what happens when you portray politicians from opposing sides as having warm friendships. Very simple. So she ran a simple experiment, and she said, all right, we're going to do it two, we're going to have two different manipulations. One, we're going to have them shown as having dinner together and engaging with each other. And the other, we're going to have them sending twi- Twitter messages to each other that are positive. And both of those interventions significantly changed people's attitudes and reduced their polarization. And other people are doing similar kinds of interventions to try to see if there are things that can be done. So, for example, people have been looking at, can we change the identity that we feel from the red, blue to the red, white, and blue that we were talking about earlier today? That, so look at the national identity as one. Can we give information on the demographics of the different groups to show that we are actually relatively similar? That also works. And um, we can also look at... Sorry, I'm trying to remember the last one. Um, you can improve civility on cable television news, and that also improves it. I have two little changes that will help not solve the problem. One is uh, stop mass blocking. Just don't let people block 5,000, 10,000 people at once because some, on, they're on some list is either liberal or conservative. If you make them block point by point, that's one. Or you can put a time limit on it. For example, Mike Murphy, who I think has left, blocked me. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, and, and, but after a while, he gave me, because I was trolling him mercil- mercilessly, and after a while, he gave me another shot. And, of course, I trolled him again, and he blocked me again. But, um, but at least you could put a damper on it. The second thing is have transparency in the algorithm. In other words, Twitter can be biased. It can be not biased. But they should tell us what the algorithm says. My, my suspicion is that there is no algorithm. It's a bunch of millennial, woke millennials up in... Uh, Silicon Valley who are persecuting conservatives. But maybe there is an algorithm. If there is an algorithm, we should know what it is. They can, they can, we're not going to stop them from using it, but they should have to, as a First Amendment matter, tell us what it is. Um, wow. Yeah. Uh, so let me just say two quick things. One is that, um, that when I worked in D.C., because I worked for Ed Markey, who was a congressman from Massachusetts, we did a lot with Ted Kennedy. The first time I met Ted Kennedy, and every time I, we met with him, the first thing he said was, we had a good idea. And he said, well, let's go talk to John about it. And I'm like, oh, John who? Well, John McCain, because Ted Kennedy and John McCain and Orrin Hatch, the three of them did not make a move without each other. And so it, it hurt me when I saw John McCain, who I do not support and never did, demonized when he ran for president because he was the guy that we went to. But I think that, that it is that collaborative view, that image of people across party lines working together that reminds all of us that it's not a war and that we're all part of the same general team. And the other thing, because I just agreed with an, disagreed with an earlier panel when they talked about how if only the far right could listen to the far left or the far left to the far right, I don't think that that's the answer. I think that if you want people to come together, it's that people on the far right and people on the far left need to hear something in the middle. It's the moderate voice that might be appealing to people on the fringe. It's not the extreme voice that's appealing to the opposite extreme. Norbert, any solutions? Well, we're all part of many tribes, not only of a political tribe. And to the extent that we could bring out the other tribalisms, such as whatever, Californian or male or female or you like this or that or so many other things because we all have multiple social identities and to the extent that we could play that out that would presumably reduce the impact of just one and that is actually something that social media could do yeah. great all right so with that, let's go to the audience and remind everyone to uh, be respectful of your questions. I don't think that's been a problem so far. Um, 
let's see, and then bring the mic over to Professor Rentellen. I want to thank John and Kevin and Bob Shrum and Dean Miller and all the teams for this wonderful conference. I have a question for Professor Krigler about media literacy and what sorts of programs might work uh, to help children be more open to uh, becoming friends with people from different backgrounds and so on. I think your, your work in, with the Penny Harvest um, and your research in political communications, you just won the Lifetime Achievement Award from the American Political Science Association. So if you could share some of your insights about that. And then a question for the whole group. Do you think that the social media um, has affected perceptions of Americans around the world in, in any particular ways you'd want to share any examples? I think that's the far more interesting question. But on the short answer for, to your earlier question, yes, there are programs that they're using in schools now to teach children about critical uh, reading of social media and other online media. And they've proven to be very effective. The digital natives are actually pretty good at it. Probably what we have to do is make sure that people who are voting are aware of these and look at the kinds of URLs, for one, the um, kinds of language that are used. Those are all clues as to what is going to be a problem there. Uh, I'll turn it over to the rest of the panel for the larger questions about the international impact. Yes. <laughs> I, I think it's, I, I just think that the rhetoric used by this country's leaders on social media, it just does not shine a positive light on this country. And it's embarrassing on a daily basis, for me at least. <laughs> As you can tell from my accent, uh, I moved to the U.S. from the University of Heidelberg, Germany. My social media network includes a lot of European psychologists, social psychologists, sociologists, survey researchers, and the answer is yes. Uh, in, in many, many ways, uh, the U.S. looks like a laughingstock. Uh, not for the reasons that Donald Trump wants you to believe why the U.S. looks like a laughingstock, but because of Donald Trump. It's hard to imagine how a country that prides itself as being leading in many areas of science, in many areas of technology, can end up with so much foolishness representing it. So my answer is yes. <laughs> so I think we're all there. Um, I was in England before the election but after Brexit was a movement. And I remember talking to somebody there and who was embarrassed about the movement toward Brexit. And I said, well, we'll see what we can do. If we could elect Donald Trump, then we'll all be even, right? But I meant it as a joke. I did not mean it as a, like, forecast. yeah, exactly, it was not a forecast. But it made, they said that they were embarrassed by the media frenzy about their internal problems. So we're that too, but I will say something, especially I'm from LA, I'm like fourth generation Los Angeles. We in, especially here, but in the United States, we are the best entertainment content creators in the world. And we are not, we have much more open sort of um, rules in terms of what we, what is okay for us to say and do, especially on public platforms, because we see it as, you know, as entertainment. And, and you look at all the influencers who've made really phenomenal, you know, you might say mistakes, but they're actually out there doing things to try to garner bigger and bigger audiences by being more and more extreme. And so, you know, the problem is that when Americans, um, as, to the extent that we are worse than others and the laughing stock, you know, we are very good at being over the top and entertaining and engaging. And the problem is that this is not just entertainment, it's the real thing. And so with people who go on Twitter or NBC or whatever and, or YouTube don't realize that this has long, again, I go back to the, the short-term gain of engaging people and the long-term ramifications of that engagement are, it's a frightening contrast. Any other questions? Yes. I'd like to add one thing to Allison's comment quickly, which is, yes, I agree with you, with all the other panelists, but I also think that we ought to remember that this tribalism thing is not something that's unique to the United States. I mean, there are populist movements in Europe that have gone very much to the right in some cases and have been very exclusionary and anti-immigrant. So, you know, we have to be careful about how we look in the mirror. Uh, so if, if we look at high crimes and misdemeanors, 
Uh, high crimes meant crimes that could only be committed by someone in higher office, like a king or a president. It didn't mean uh, uh, terrible crimes. So if that light of, of what it means, uh, how would you reflect on what's going on? Because that could include both Clinton's act uh, uh, and the acts of, of uh, President Trump. What Bill Clinton did wasn't a crime at all. It was unethical. Maybe I'm misunderstanding your question. The, the, the term, uh, the loss of high crimes and misdemeanors and uh, uh, with, within some sexual harassment kinds of things that would certainly could fall under misdemeanor. And it meant for uh, an act that a president or, or a king might do that a normal citizen, it wouldn't be a crime for that person. So they meant it not to mean crimes necessarily. So you're okay with the president no, no, asking a foreign whether, leader to meddle in our elections? Uh, uh, I asked, uh, I, I'm against, uh, I, uh, no, I'm not. Uh, but I think the, the point is, uh, uh, doesn't it, it, what it means is we're trying to hold these individuals to a higher bar and if that higher bar uh, would, would, would certainly include uh, 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 interfering with an election, but I'm wondering uh, uh, more for, from uh, the comment from a professor of law from Harvard uh, 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 who misinterpreted uh, a law as it, was, as it was written. Do you think I'm a professor of law at Harvard? No, you were, weren't. Didn't you receive a law degree from... Uh I got a law degree, yes, but yeah. that's very different. Um, the, uh, um, I think there has to be, you don't, it doesn't have to be a crime, and, and you're right that you know, this is the sort of thing that would fit in the general category of high crimes. I just think there has to be a, some judgment of how severe and awful it is. Otherwise, structurally, you're going to have a situation where every president is a has something against them and there's an impeachment proceeding and it's just a question of do they get 51 votes and I don't think that's the structure the framers had in mind. So there has to be some sort of threshold that they have to punch through and I just don't think this does it. Okay, we've got some more questions uh, on this side. Yes. Uh, yeah, got a couple of questions about like uh, official media channels. Um, in terms of like, I personally lost a lot of trust when Hillary was using her personal email and then deleting the servers, you know, deleting that, the servers that that was running on. And then, you know, I think it's unfortunate that Trump you, probably saved Twitter and, you know, uses it extensively for government communications. So I was just curious if the panel had any thoughts on, you know, should some sort of official government channels be used for the news and also in terms of like the younger generations, a lot of other, and a lot of other countries use digital technology so you can vote and communicate with your government much more easily, basically through your phone, and should we be doing that more? I mean, you know, that would be like saying, um, so the end, I mean, my answer is that all lines of communication should be at least available, right? But you, you wouldn't want to say the president can't speak to the news or the president can't speak in a town square. So the president's ability or any all politicians' ability to use all of the social media channels is, you know, seems like the best, the, one of the best things that's come of social media. The problem that get, or the complication of it or the complexity is that they aren't, well, there's been some rulings now that are, make this muddier, but the reality is that these are all private businesses. And so they can have their own rules, just like any private club. They can have a dress code for all intents and purposes of how you can act. And so if Twitter has one set of rules and Facebook has another and you could block people here but not there, then the question becomes whether or not that's um, equivalent to, a, to the president speaking to the news media or in a town square. And so I think we have to figure out what the rules of engagement are on these private business platforms. More questions uh, right here. Uh, thank you. Um, so, um, you know, one of the things I've observed is, um, uh, you know, that there was an analysis done that 70 percent of the content that people watch on YouTube is not stuff they search for, but it's recommended by YouTube. So the YouTube platform is actually generating a lot of the editorial implicitly by the uh, algorithms of what you choose to 
to, to click on. Of course, they give you um, uh, stuff that makes you click on a lot more, makes you outraged, probably even more on Facebook. So I've been involved with a, a, a project that we're funding to do a test where users would be allowed to configure up front what type of videos they'd like to watch. Not specifically, but whether they want to watch more diversity, whether they want to watch more centrist stuff, whether they really want to watch extreme stuff. And with this app, it would basically block the stuff that's really extreme or watch, uh, allow users to be shown videos from the other side, which would be sort of like an intervention into the YouTube system, so to speak. And I'm wondering, you know, who knows if this system's going to work, but I'm wondering what, you th what the panel thinks about whether uh, platforms should be compelled, if the system works, to allow users to have a choice whether they want to be fed all these extreme videos or maybe have an opportunity to, to have more diversity in, in, the, uh, in the recommendation stream. I worry about that a little bit because, so I'll give you some anecdotal evidence uh, for something that happened. It's involving a young man, the New York Times wrote a lengthy profile about how he became radicalized by the right wing through the YouTube videos that he was watching. And so the YouTube algorithm changed after this profile came out. I noticed it because my front page on YouTube was very different. There was a lot more variety, which I like. But basically what happened was he one day clicked on a right-wing extremist video on YouTube. And then the algorithm was set up to keep feeding him that type of content. So he became radicalized. What de-radicalized him, and I love this, uh, some of my colleagues, not at the Young Turks, uh, someone named Sam Cedar who hosts a show called Majority Report, decided to game the algorithm. So he used tags and keywords that a lot of these right-wing extremists would use, and then his videos would get fed into these algorithms that include right-wing extremists. Now, if you click on the videos and you listen to the content, he would debunk a lot of these right-wing conspiracy theories, for instance. And so little by little, this young man becomes de-radicalized. And then he starts watching a variety of content. He realizes, oh my God, I've been you know, consuming all this right-wing extremist content and it radicalized me and now I realize what's going on. And luckily he spoke to the media about it and there was some real action on YouTube's, uh, you know, on YouTube's algorithm and now you see a little more variety. The reason why I'm a little worried is because if you're predisposed or if you're already radicalized in one way or the other and you get to choose what kind of content is served to you, are you likely to choose content that you're going to disagree with at first? Probably not. But I do think it's an interesting experiment. I mean, I, I'd like to see more studies done into that to see how people respond to that type of platform, whether or not they would choose a variety of content. I, okay. Let me add a word. Uh, I, I think in principle, anything that increases the diversity of your media diet is probably a good thing. And the other thing that I think we could expect is that there's clearer information about what society is, so that the piece of media literacy is actually easier for you, that you don't have to dig around and recognize which URL is proper or not, but that you actually can easily see that, and it shouldn't be terribly difficult for networks, for the social media to manage that. Okay, this has been an outstanding pa panel, outstanding discussion. Thank you all very much. Thank you all for attending, and, and Bob has the final comments. Uh, I'll second that by saying thank you all for coming to what was, at least for me, an informative, intriguing, and even spectacular day. Uh, I look forward to seeing you, should you want to come, at our Warsaw Conference on Practical Politics on January 24, 2020, which will focus on the presidential race on the eve of the Iowa caucuses and the New Hampshire primary. Uh, by the way, next Tuesday, Stan Greenberg, uh, Bill Clinton's pollster, pollster for uh, Al Gore, John Kerry, the t Democrats in 2018. I will be interviewing him about his provocative new book, R.I.P.G.O.P., at Ground Zero at 5 p.m. Ron Christie will be there, uh, of, uh, our, our center fellow and uh, Bush uh, Cheney alumnus, uh, to disagree, I assume. Uh, Anyway, I want to say in conclusion, once again, thank you. Thank our panelists. This kind of conference is central to our mission, and we are glad to have you be a part of it. Thank you. <laughs>